Okay. Thank you, Kenny. And thanks for the opportunity. And I'd also like to, to acknowledge the local indigenous people here in this region, the Wajak Noongar, who really have a great understanding of the details of nature and also a real systems perspective, and they're willing to share it. It's great. This is uh, our local bushland. Now, uh, just tell me if this is all working good. All I can see is my screen, of course. Um, now is a great time to be interested in reef morphology or to develop an interest in reef morphology because the imagery of the three dimensional imagery of reefs is really advancing very quickly at all scales from individual colonies to multi square meter patches to whole reefs and entire reef provinces. But our, our understanding of how reef form is created is lagging behind the imagery. And uh, well, inevitably, we do know that reef morphology is important because it's, uh, it's the foundation of reef ecology. The, the reef morphology is the single best predictor of reef communities. But that's very much a two-way street because uh, the reef is a self-built structure. So you could just as easily say that the ecology is the foundation of the morphology. And in many cases, I think this association between morphology and ecology is because the ecology has created the morphology, it does, doesn't just live there and depend on it. So how could we investigate that relationship and where should we look? Somewhere like Cockatoo Reef in the southern GBR would be a good place not to start because it's so complex. There are so many processes happening here, like um, many interacting contemporary processes, overprinting earlier processes, and not just marine processes, relatively old reefs like this. Uh, they actually only spend about 10 to 20 percent percent of their time submerged. Most of the time they're terrestrial environments. They're low hills or plateaus on a coastal plain and subject to terrestrial processes, namely erosion. So understanding a reef like Cockatoo would be an aspirational target, but much better to start simple. And the ideal situation would be a reef built by a single type of organism over a flat sea floor in a sheltered environment during a single period of sea level rise. And there are reefs like that. There are probably many of them. This is one in the Houtman Abrolhos Islands off Western Australia. And this reef is essentially a giant blanket of staghorn acropora. The cellular honeycomb structure looks complicated, but it's actually not. All of these shapes are expressions of a single underlying form, which is an, like an egg carton. The reef is an egg carton growing to sea level. And if you imagine what you'd see at the surface when that happens, you first see round patch reefs as these dome tops approach sea level, and then uh, radiating ridges as the saddles between the domes reach sea level and eventually a solid platform surrounding circular holes. And that's just what we see here. One, two, three is the, the round reefs to the ridges to the platform. And the process generating the, uh, the egg cart morphology is also simple uh, according to this model I'll describe. The model is a cellular automaton. It was developed with my uh, co-author and stepbrother, Mike Hamblin. It represents corals as one meter cubes and it builds reefs um, out of as stacks of cubic corals. So this is a, uh, a cross section of flat seafloor, which is colonized by corals that grow and form a reef. 
Well, this would be a, a patch reef, six meters wide and three meters high. These are the growth directions allowed in this default model. It can, can uh, corals can grow in any direction randomly, uh, only constrained by sea level, 30 meters above. And these are model reefs created from that model. In the top left is uh, an overhead view of a patch reef with um, the shading corresponds to depth. The seafloor is 30 meters and the reef flat at sea level is zero meters. B is a three-dimensional view of that same reef and then C and D are patch reef, uh, coalescing patch reef systems. They're reasonably realistic looking reefs, but they're, they're not good representations of staghorn because they're very steep and spiky. Um, the, some of these corals on this reef projecting four meters above their immediate surroundings. So that, that can't happen on uh, staghorn reefs because those colonies will collapse before that point. Here's uh, an Abrolhos reef slope showing lots of collapsed colonies and one here about two meters, uh, two meters tall, which is looking pretty unstable and about to collapse. So we can represent that in the model by simply by preventing corals growing taller than two meters, but still allowing them to collapse down slope. And that's, that's all it takes to make the egg carton. Here's a three dimensional view on the left and an overhead view of a, uh, on the right. Here's a larger view of the model reefs on the left and the real reefs on the right. And I'm very confident in this model because um, not only does it look right, it's very robust. Models that have a low frequency of collapse can't make the egg carton and models that have a high frequency of collapse can't be prevented from making the egg carton. But it does have a limitation and that is that it can't produce cells more than about 100 meters diameter. And many cells, especially in the Pacific atolls, are much larger than that. For example, in Mataeva Atoll, the cells are three to 400 meters diameter. Atafu Atoll, they're up to several kilometers diameter. The structure is very similar and they're all staghorn reefs. So there must be another process not represented in the model that generates the large scale cells. The Abrolhos cells provide or suggest a potential mechanism. Uh, in the cells, the, uh, the shallow slopes are densely covered with living Acropora, but that declines rapidly with depth. And in this cell, the live staghorn gets, only gets seven or eight meters depth around the entire cell. That's not a light limitation because there's plenty of light. Instead, that very consistent depth suggests stratification, and that is exactly what's happening in there. Here are some depth profiles from that cell. And the water column intermittently, quite often, stratifies out. There's a slight temperature difference, but that's enough to cap off the surface. And then the deeper layers get very depleted in pH and especially oxygen. Staghorn needs about four milligrams per liter of oxygen and more than a, any more than a day or two below that, they start to die. Here, these are just dissolved oxygen profiles now from that same cell collected over a couple of years. The blue profiles are in spring and the red profiles in autumn. And uh, Stratification is much stronger in autumn because that's the period of warm, calm weather. It's obviously highly variable, but it uh, often drops below four, four milligrams per litre around about the seven, eight metre level. So that's reasonable circumstantial evidence that stratification and hypoxia control staghorn depth distribution in that cell and in all the other abrola cells, which are broadly similar. And stratification is also a potential mechanism for creating the uh, large scale cells. If, uh, if we imagine now a, a lagoon floor colonized by staghorn, 
this is a conceptual model now, not a quantitative model. The Saquon Pat Saquon patch reefs grow and coalesce to form those cellular reefs, small scale cellular reefs. And then if there's a stratification event that would kill the basins of the cells, but the shallow areas would remain alive and continue growing, which would reduce circulation and make the subsequent stratification events probably more severe such that they might start to capture adjacent cells. And if that process continues, then they might keep capturing adjacent cells until they become a large scale cell. I'm not as confident in that model. Uh, like I said, it's not quantitative, it's not really tested in that way, but it's a, it's a reasonable model and it is testable. One prediction it would make is that all large scale cells should contain small scale cells. And that does seem to happen. Here are two examples of that arrangement of small scale cells within large scale cells. So if the models are correct, this is, uh, these patterns are all ecologically controlled. In fact, they're genetically controlled and they are a, um, a diagnostic, uh, diagnostic uh, form or phenotype even of Saquon acropora. But the, the cellular reefs are just one example, just one pattern. That's Mateva Atoll again. Uh, it's that's gorgeous, isn't it? Okay, quick aside. Mataiva in Mataiva the reef has grown over an old phosphate deposit, which was guano. And there was a proposal to mine it. This whole thing was going to be mined. Um, it wasn't economic. That's the only reason it didn't happen. Geo heritage it really should be looked after, shouldn't it? Anyway, that's just one pattern. There are many others and many more to be discovered as uh, as imagery and coverage progresses. Is Pearl and Hermes Atoll in the Hawaiian chain? Alacran Reef off Mexico. This is a coralline algal reef north of Broome in Western Australia. And Serrana Bank in the Caribbean. All of these patterns are probably ecological. They're, uh, the way I like to think of it is that the, the patterns are symbols conveying ecological information. And if we can learn the, uh, if we can learn those symbols or learn the language, then we can much better understand the reef. And in particular, if we learn pattern forming processes in one reef, we can, uh, we'll have a shortcut to understanding reefs elsewhere that show the same pattern. And most of these patterns are globally distributed. And, and the processes that uh, form these patterns are very likely to be important almost by definition because they're shaping the reef. Investigating them is not, uh, isn't a, a hypothesis based science, at least not initially, because if you try to guess at mechanisms, you'll probably get it wrong. You, you tend to think of mechanisms operating at the scale of the structure, but that's, that isn't how it happens. The structure emerges from processes that, that you can't even see at that scale. And that's the, because that's the nature of self-organization. And that's why cellular automata are so good at, um, at generating structure because they operate very locally and very small scale. Uh, each each uh, cell operates to the same rules and those rules are based entirely on the local neighborhood. In the previous example, these cubes represented coral colonies, but they could represent anything at any, at any scale. Any process that affects the carbonate budget, positive or negative, direct or indirect, can create reef morphology. So, for, uh, for researchers, it's worthwhile considering what if 
effect the processes you're working on might have on that on that spatial carbonate budget, and uh, and whether that might scale up to form a pattern, and perhaps how it, that could the process could be abstracted and modelled. It's also worthwhile going in the other direction and trying to get uh, good large scale uh, or good aerial images of your reef sites to try and um, look for patterns or maybe even drone mosaics like this one look look for patterns and try and work out what those how those patterns are defined on the reef what they mean so from that perspective is a, a, a challenge which would be to work out what these patterns are. They're not common, but they are, they are globally spread. They're pretty fascinating. They just seem to be saying something about uh, information, communication. These ones are in Borneo, but there are also some in, uh, in the Barrier Reef, here at Hardy Reef, and also some in the One Tree Island Lagoon less well defined. So uh, this, this should be tractable problems. All of these patterns really should be. It's just a matter of basically getting in there and, and seeing what's there. And if, if there are consistencies between this site and that site, then that's probably a good place to start, uh, you know, start investigating, making and testing hypotheses. Uh, and also a good excuse to collaborate or get to Borneo. That is, isn't that reef amazing? Look at it. That is really spectacular. Okay. Um, well, that's actually my talk already. Uh, but if you're interested, um, I've made a list here of other re researchers in reef geomorphology. And um, maybe you could screenshot that or, or ask me for it. Look at look up some of these names and papers, and you could uh, you know get a taste of what's happening and where things are going. Uh, Sam Perkis in particular is working in self-organisation, and I think he has a call out right now for for um, PhD and postdoc students. Okay, that's my talk, and uh, of course, thank you very much to people and organisations who have helped me in my research. Thank you, Dave. Very interesting um, putting together some of those links between ecology and reef formation. I, I know I definitely dive or snorkel around or look at aerial photos and, and wish I understood how on earth these things <laughs> are made or create themselves. And it's really nice to, to see the thought and, and models behind that process as well. So thank you for that. I'll um, open the floor to anyone online who has a question for Dave. Hi. I can't see everyone, sorry. So if you do, um, feel free to just speak up. Hi, Dave, it's Joe Bucky. Oh, Joe, hi. Good to hear from you. <laughs> Yeah, we're sitting in the same um, city and I've been meaning to catch up with you for a long time. So um, for everyone else's sake, I'm also doing my um, PhD on the Abrolis um, and I'm looking at more the, the mechanism of what keeps the reef flat and what the, the, the drivers of um, cover on the flat tops of that same environment. So how cover changes over time um, with variation in water level. So really interesting to me to see somebody else studying the same place. Um, and I've been aware of your work for since I started my PhD and it's really been very helpful. So I just thought I'd let you know that. Um, really so interesting, very novel thinking. I'm really a great fan. Um, just one small comment that I thought I'd make is the um, the fact that the stratification seems to be greatest. That might be easy. <laughs> the stratification's um, 
west in spring um, and that's really the time when the water levels are the lowest as well um, and that that might be one of the mechanisms that's exacerbating the stratification if you've got kind of less turbulence over the top of the reef platform um, and then the other thought in relation to uh, autumn so sorry did you say autumn spring yeah, well, I, I would say autumn based on temperature, but um, that tidal influence would be massive, of course, if if the cells become isolated. Yeah. So did you did you did you say you said spring, not autumn, didn't you? I was saying autumn, so April, May. That's where, actually I only I only went there in those two seasons, so I don't know about the rest of the year, but uh, April. Because the other reason I would be thinking maybe spring would be the time. Not only are the water levels lowest, but also with the temperature increasing, you're going to be getting that kind of solar heating of the top layer, which would start the stratification process, whereas in autumn, you're more likely to be getting the cold layer up top, which would turn the water body over and de-stratify. So um, I've been, I've had some loggers out there as well, that kind of haven't had a look at the data yet. Um, but yeah, quite curious around that thing. So happy to take that discussion offline sometime. Mm -hmm. Keep talking Actually, to you. March and April, I think, were bad times, temperature-wise anyway. I mean, that, you know, that's my data. They were March, April, those red lines. But yeah, def definitely any any hydrodynamic influence that will shut down circulation is going to cause some problems. So that's the time of the year when the Lewin current's the strongest and the water level is actually higher, but you might have the warm water on top, which is, you know, um, exacerbating stratification. The that warm water cap or any any cap is is uh, totally critical. Yeah, the 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 really critical thing about oxygen is that it diffuses. It just basically can't diffuse through water. Mm. If if uh, for water to reach the bottom of a swimming pool by diffusion alone would take four months. Mm. So that that's a critical thing. Uh, oxygen can only be can only arrive either from uh, overturning of the surface water or photosynthetic production. So um, if those two things aren't happening, then you're going to have oxygen problems. And of course, the photosynthesis only happens in the day. So um, things get especially bad at night. All right. Thank you uh, for that question. and line of communication. Um, I see Graham has his hand up. If he wants to go next. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, I just wanted to raise uh, briefly the question of whether you've looked a bit outside the coral reef literature. So there's in the nutrient poor environment of the Sahel, you get these vegetation patterns, which are people know as tiger bush, um, which have similar shapes and morphologies in some ways. And there's quite a lot of work on those patterns, how they arise, what causes them. Um, there's a bunch of quite mathematical papers by a guy called Max Rietkirk um, that might be of interest just in, in helping you think about how uh, the process pattern link might occur. So I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen those, but just something I wanted to highlight. Thanks, Graham. Yep, thank you. I, I, I'm kind of semi-familiar with that, with that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's very relevant. And there are patterns like that in the spin effects of the Pilbara too. Um, yeah, I guess, it, I don't know how far or how, how analogous they are, but fundamentally, they're, yeah, they're probably operating some similar way. Um, and they're probably self-organized based on, you know, small scale, uh, emergent small scale patterns. Thank you. I think Sarah may have a question next. Hi, David. <clears throat> Thanks for that talk. I really enjoyed seeing all of that aerial imagery of reefs, and I agree that some of them are really rather beautiful. Um, my question is about using technology like drones. I think we're in an era now where certainly some of the lagoons that you showed us, they're several kilometers across, and it probably wouldn't take that much to do an aerial drone survey and stitch several thousand images together, and that would be of a sort of a spatial resolution that you can see, almost see individual corals. In fact, you can see 
individual corals. So I'm wondering whether or not that might provide a basis for an enhanced cellular automaton model that actually represents a, a real life lagoon and then projecting forward how that might look in say 10 years from now and then revisiting it 10 years from now to see whether or not those projections at that scale were realistic. That would be brilliant. Yeah, it's, I guess it's going to happen. That'd be just fantastic. Um, the uh, Rosensteel, the, you know, the guy Ved Cheria from NASA, who's now at Rosensteel, he's pretty deeply into that, all of that imagery. He developed the fluid lensing, which is just such a beautiful idea because um, it takes what we thought was a disadvantage in trying to view through the ocean surface of all the uh, complications and turns it into an advantage by using the magnification of those movements and, um, to magnify the, the uh, final image he can create. And also the magnification of the sunlight onto the seafloor to penetrate a little further. Um, I don't know that Ved's very interested in the ecology, but he's working with Sam Perkis, who, who is. And so, yep, I think they'll be doing things like that. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens. Um, yeah, I yeah, don't know whether you're going to try something like that, but I'd love I don't to see have it. Any plans. <laughs> <laughs> I would wave the flag for Cocos Keeling Atoll, though, and that's fairly close to you guys in WA. That's got a, a particularly nice set of reticulate corals in its lagoon, and uh, they cross a, a range of environmental gradients in terms of water circulation um, and uh, tidal fluctuation and things like that. So that would be a nice case study site. Would be very good, yeah. Uh, open to the north uh, northwest, isn't it? And then more enclosed to the northeast. Yeah. Yep. And the, and the uh, Kiribati lagoon, very similar to that too. Open to the east and close to the to the um, uh, open to the west and close to the east. And so yeah, those kind of those kind of environments are very good for investigating this thing because they're a, a real space for time continuum. You've potentially got thousands of years that you you can look at. Um, sequence of reefs that represent thousands of years of transition so for all sorts of ecological questions they're very good um, kind of study nurseries every every atoll is like a petri dish uh, abrolis is great like that because of that that age sequence that i showed the the round reef to the ridges to the cells all sorts of ecological changes occur in there so just great place to, to look at natural change. Um, you know, all, all of these patterns, they're basically totally, totally natural. They've all developed over thousands of years, no human influence whatsoever. So I, th I think that's important to try and understand the natural change so that we can subtract it and work out better what, what we're doing. And things are often get pretty bad for a reef. You know that the, uh, um, Actually, things get pretty bad. The final stage of any reef, you know, the, the whole goal of a reef is to grow to sea level. When it gets there, it dies. And uh, a lot of pretty uh, drastic things happen in the late stage when it, as it approaches sea level and gets smashed and cooked. Naturally, completely naturally, we do need to know that sequence. That's very true. I've never thought of it like that. Uh, yep, another question there. Um, well, firstly, they don't all die when they get to the surface. So that's kind of because <laughs> okay. I'm generalization. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at. And in fact, particularly at the Abrolhos, that um, the I'm back flat, in a thousand years though. Yeah, yeah. Well, which is a bit my question. So one of the things that I found really interesting about your work and Lindsay Collins beforehand was that when I was younger, the um, the wisdom was that they were cast formation. Um, the blue holes were an antecedent um, geological formation. Um, and that, you know, this work really fills in all the gaps to show that that's not actually the case. And I suppose my question is whether or not there's, uh, you can go back and have a look at geological formations on land that are, um, are have been um, driven by this process as well. So whether or not it's it's um, you can see it in in old reef 
formations in terrestrial geology. I'm not aware of uh, this specific form, but kind of similar things. Marty McNeil's working on the Halameda banks uh, behind the ribbon reefs, which have pretty amazing structure, and there may be some some analogs of that. Um, Sam Perkis has got seismic from deep under the Barents Sea, which seems to show some similar structures. So yeah, this, this, um, these processes probably have been operating for a long time. And uh, yeah, the structure may be diagnostic, diagnostic of organisms that have hit upon this great strategy of growing very fast, branching, collapsing, just, uh, over, uh, competing, overtaking everything, but um, eventually coming into competition with each other and just having to grow flat out or, or uh, you're overtaken and being driven to fast growth and that requiring a fast metabolism and that requiring lots of oxygen and that's when they become reliant on oxygen if it's not there they, um, they uh, die very quickly so yeah it is, it is a great strategy great strategy for quickly occupying new marine territory when sea level rises but uh, yeah in the end it's kind of um, a bit self-defeating in some ways, but I guess, you know, the corals have already made a huge reef, so they've been successful. And in the abrolis holes, Joe, you might know in, in some of those abrolis holes, the rim is actually, has a totally different coral community in it. That seems to have been able to beat the staghorn in its own game by making a, a steep wall so that staghorn can't colonise it. And um, those survive really well for a long time in those cells. And And the... I mean, the edges are different as well because they, they're they not as limited by low water events because this, they get splashed from the, from the waves. So I think that that's one of the mechanisms that makes the edge a lot more vibrant than the middle of those. Um, but yes, there's, it is, there are other um, corals other than staghorns along those edges. Um, I agree. And there's quite a lot of actually you know, there's quite there's quite a lot of um, other corals other than a cropper on the top. Um, it's still the dominant one, but there's a lot more diversity than that would um, indicate. Yeah, yeah, I have made a lot of simplifications and generalizations here. Yep, there are loads of corals in there, um, but uh, the main structure is staghorn, and, and through the Holocene has been. Uh, Lindsay got a core right through that whole reef system which is 40 metres thick, very thick, and it's basically staghorn almost all the way. And then lots of little complications and differences arise when the, when the reef approaches sea level. Yeah, including all that stuff you're working on. Thank you. Is there anyone else online who would like to ask Dave a question? Yeah, hi Dave, it's Marty McNeil here. Just saying hello. <laughs> thanks Hi, for the mate. talk and thanks for the thanks for the shout out for Halameda Bioherm research. Um, I'm not sure you probably are aware that we have got an investigative voyage going up to the Northern GBR in August September, and um, we'll be doing some cross cross shelf transects of um, water sampling and what have you close to the sediment water interface across the Halameda. Biohem. So hopefully we should have quite a lot more new um, hydrochemistry data that we can play with after that voyage. So it's probably worth us having a, another chat at some time <laughs> in the future after that. Yeah, definitely would be. No, no, I wasn't aware of that, but yeah, um, certainly a fascinating problem. If uh, yeah, people could check that and out. There. So many parallels. Um, from your presentation and, and Sam Perks's work and the Holocene Halameda biohomes in the GBR. So mm. yeah, definitely lots of, um, I think processes that are somewhat universal, regard, not, not necessarily regardless of the, of the organism, but um, certainly not, not only restricted to corals. Yep, definitely. And um, maybe, I mean, ideally we could model it yeah, so, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 We'll get okay. data on the tops of the donuts and down in the hollows and things like that. Mm -hmm. Good. 
Good to yeah, know. What, what's the difference in elevation? <laughs> like 10 um, metres difference? Can be up to 20 metres, so yep. 10 to 20 metres difference yep. in elevation. Yeah. Okay. Look yep. forward to that. Mm. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Marty. Nice to hear from you. Um, anyone else online? This has been a nice Q&A session and, and conversation session following the talk. I don't see anyone else with a hand up or stepping up in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, I was interested in the carbon budget stuff. Um, and how you see this um, this process potentially influencing it, whether or not it's a limiting factor, because in fact, it, you know, the, the blue holes aren't infilling, so it's actually limits the carbon process, the carbon um, sequestration process. So, yeah, I just wondered if you would like to elaborate on that a bit. The... Uh... The biological accretion is certainly very limited in there, and, and uh, I, the pH drops very low too. So it might it might even be dissolving. I'm not sure. I have um, some holes getting down to 7.6, 7.5, 7.6. So I don't know what would be happening there. It might it might actually be losing carbon. But in general, the even if the corals are all shut down, those holes do fill up with sediment just washing in from the surrounding reef flat. So, um, yeah, still a positive budget in most of them. All righty. Thank you very much, Dave. I think that might be it for questions from what I can see. It's really nice to have this uh, Perspective for reefs, we, I think, have had the majority of talks focused on biology and ecology. It's really nice to have that forms and geomorphology kind of angle and perspective presented. And from a representative from WA, I think is really nice as well. And we'd like to kind of keep up those uh, extensions, I, for lack of a better word, across the country. Um, I feel like, yeah, sometimes we are <laughs> at a bit of a divide without even thinking about it. Um, and I think the, the in-person conference at the end of this year, again, the 25th to the 28th of November in Brisbane. Um, so everyone put that in your diaries. And our next seminar will be in two weeks. So it comes up fast, but um, is in line with our, um, at the same time as our AGM for the ACRS, our annual meeting. So it would be great if everyone could put that in their calendar too, the 17th of May, starting at 12. And we'll have uh, Anne Hoggett from Lizard Island presenting on her history there as a, um, as a researcher and as a manager. So again, thank you to Dave for today. Um, the lecture's recorded and we'll be putting it online. Uh, and see you all very soon. Yep. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks a lot, everybody. And um, yeah, be great to make a better east-west connection and also a better geo-bio connection. Reef morphology is fundamentally a bioscience. So yeah, excellent. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave.